Good morning. It's Tuesday. It's Tulsa Tuesday, as a matter of fact. Dr. Decker and I are going to John 3.16, where I'll play the fiddle because I can move my arm now. Because this is a holiday week, they bumped me from PT. I only got one physical therapy this week, but I'll keep doing my exercises every day. We don't want to lose ground. Uh, yesterday, I gave you a bunch of background material from chapter 47 of Jeremiah that I didn't really think about while I was preparing the lesson. My, the phrase, as I explained yesterday, the remnant of Kaftor kept tickling my brain. I knew I knew stuff about that that I had not shared, so I started checking references and checking my notes, and there we go. So that was most of yesterday's program, although we did open up Jeremiah's prophecy from the Lord against Moab. Now, Moab is tricky, and uh, we'll be doing some background on Moab, too. I began that yesterday by reminding you who Moab is. Moab was one of Lot's sons, one that he, <coughs> the elder son, uh, the son of the elder daughter, uh, rather. And then he had another son by the younger daughter. And I read you the, the awful text as it happened in history. And uh, again, just bolsters my faith in the word of God. It's not a man, a book that man would write if he could, and it's not a man, a book that man could write if he would. Because you had to have the power of the Holy Ghost to write this book. And there are 40 different authors over 1,600 years, and it all says the same thing. And over 2,100 years, if you count Job, as I do. Most people don't. Moses didn't write Job. Job wrote during the days of Abraham. Moses wrote 500 years later. So, just so we can be clear about that. Now, the, the textual critics will say that Job was a lot later book, but Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And I have that of authority uh, from the Word of God itself <laughs> and not from something some guy found in a, on a beach somewhere or in a cave or in a plant pot at the Vatican. So, but that's not what the sermon's about today. We're going to stick with Moab. <clears throat> Chapter 48, the Gospel of Jeremiah, the book of the prophet Jeremiah. I guess Moab... Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. Woe unto Nebo. You remember Nebo? God told Moses to climb up Mount Nebo, and then he'd see the promised land from there, and then God was going to kill him. Because Moses disobeyed. He disobeyed one time from following the Lord and sanctifying the Lord before the people. Man, I've sinned a lot more times than that since I started preaching. So if Moses can get rebuked, how much more the rebuke for Jimmy Harris? As I mentioned yesterday, or maybe, I don't know, the day before, I don't know when I mentioned it, but it's something new that I've learned. It's about separation from the world, living a separate, holy, sanctified life. The higher your calling, the higher the office that God called you in, the higher position that God puts you in, the bigger platform that he gives you, the greater your separation has to be from the world. And by the world, I mean this devil's world, the world, the flesh, and the devil, as it were. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. <clears throat> he that loveth the world don't love the Father. 
all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. This is the world, the flesh, and the devil. You got to be separate from that if God is giving you a big microphone. The converse is true. The more you separate yourself from the world and the greater your separation in sanctity and holiness and living a separated life, the greater that separation, the higher God will make your calling. He will make you stand before kings because the time always comes when there's only a handful of people that will stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to decide ahead of time that you're going to be one of them because if you don't decide ahead of time, you will lose in the decision at the moment. The decision must be made now. Because when it comes time to die for Jesus, you won't be ready. You've got to be ready now. If you live long enough in this current society, and they will come for you and kill you because you believe in Christ. All that serve the devil, which is most of the country, most of the world, this is the devil's world. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction, and many there be which go in their head. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I tend to think of us as myself as part of the precious few instead of the <coughs> frozen chosen. <laughs> I've heard, as I've heard it's called, especially in some Baptist and Presbyterian churches, and frankly nowadays you can't tell the difference because they're both Calvinistic and they're turning toward hierarchy and they're going to get liberal just like the Methodists did. Excuse me. I'm okay, friends, never fear. If I die doing this program one day, it would be a good way to go out. I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll go to heaven doing what I wanted to do, doing what I loved. Uh, chapter 48, we'll go back to it. I was talking about Nebo. Yeah, he disobeyed God once, Moses did I think about all the times that I've disobeyed since I was called into the ministry. I think about the things that God won't even let me see from Mount Nebo. But he lets me see all I need to see. And that separation I was talking about, it grows more every day. Come out from among them. Touch not the unclean thing. Be ye separate. Against Moab, chapter 48, saith the Lord. Of hosts, the God of Israel, woe unto Nebo. That was Moses' mountain. It is spoiled. Kiriathaim is confounded and taken. Miss Gab is confounded and dismayed. These are the cities of Moab. There should be no more praise in Moab. In Heshbon they have devised evil against it. Come, let us cut it off from being a nation. So what the Babylonians are going to do to it. After the destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah is writing this probably 15 years before the destruction of Jerusalem. That's when and Jehoiakim was still king. Also thou shalt be cut down, O madman, the sword shall pursue thee. He called them crazy because they thought that the sword would come 
on them. There's a tick. Can you believe it? I went outside for five minutes, and there was a tick crawling on my arm. I'm going to wash you down the sink. What a deal. Well, I guess the ticks are going to be thick this summer. I don't know. I'm glad I saw him crawling on me before he got dug in. I took the trash out. He must have fell out of a tree. <laughs> what a deal. That's the last thing I need is to get an infected tick bite or get sick from that. Well, you know, something's going to kill you. That's why you need to be ready. He called them madmen, said they were crazy because they didn't believe the sword was going to come up on their land. God will explain some of this here in a minute. The sword shall pursue thee. A voice of crying shall be heard in Horonaim, spoiling and great destruction. Moab is destroyed. Her little ones have caused a cry to be heard. When Israel first was trying to get into the land of Canaan, God gave them some instructions, and one of them was not to fight with Moab, because Moab was kinfolk. I'll explain that in a minute. Let's carry on with today's message. Moab has destroyed her little ones have caused a cry to be heard. Now beginning in verse 5. We're in the going up of Luth. Continual weeping shall go up. For in the going up of Horonam, the enemies have heard the cries of destruction. Your enemies are going to hear you well. The Babylonians are going to come just like they're going to come and fight Jerusalem. So what are you so, so excited about, Moab? Flee, save your lives, be like the heath in the wilderness. Like a naked tree in the wilderness. A stripped tree with no leaves, no bark, but still standing. For because thou hast trusted in thy works, verse 7, and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken, and Chemosh shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. That was their version of Baal and their version of Molech. Chemosh was the abomination of the Moabites. Like Baal, they sacrificed their children unto him. They made their children to pass through the fire. And the spoilers shall come upon every city, and no city shall escape. The valley also shall perish. And the plain shall be destroyed as the Lord has spoken. Give wings unto Moab, that it may fly and get away. See, this prophecy has a near fulfillment. When Jeremiah wrote it, the fall of Moab was less than 20 years away. Because the same army that destroys Jerusalem will destroy Moab and did and he was telling him to get out of town run before the enemy gets there give wings unto Moab that it may flee and get away for the cities thereof shall be desolate without any to dwell in them Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth his sword from blood. There's somebody that's negligent in the world of God, word of God, they need to be cursed. They could be anybody that pretends to speak for God and they don't. Could be anybody who claims to preach. God's truth and they preach lies that has more to 
do with taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain than merely saying, God damn somebody. Asking God to damn a guy or a country or an idea. That is taking the Lord's name in vain. But saying that he said something when he didn't, that's worse. Saying that he does something when he don't, that's worse. Saying that he didn't do something that he did, that's worse. That means you you call God a liar if you deny his word. You are negligent. You are deceitful. Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. He's telling everybody to run away, but if you're a soldier, you need to fight. If you keep your sword away from blood, that means you turn tail and ran. Well, they ran through the briars and they ran through the brambles. And then this is one of the reasons it's coming upon them. And then we'll, we'll go back to Deuteronomy. Verse 11, Moab hath been at ease. From his youth, he hath settled on his lees and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel. Neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore his taste remained in him. It stood in him, his taste remained in him, and his scent has not changed. He's been at ease from his youth. What was Moab's beginning? Well, we know that God, the angels of the Lord, came and delivered Lot, his wife, and their two daughters out of Sodom before God destroyed it. Lot asked to go to Zoar instead of to hide in the mountains because Zoar was a little city and a little town. The angel said, okay, we won't destroy that place. We're going to destroy the west of it. you got to get out of here. Don't look back. Well, Mrs. Lot looked back. She was changed into a pillar of salt. She was a pillar coated with alkaline ash. That's what happens when like a nuclear bomb goes off in the desert. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Mrs. Lot lost her life. Lot went to the cave with his two daughters, daughter one and daughter two. They got him drunk, and he had sex with them. <clears throat> it's a horrible thing, but the record is clear. With the elder daughter, he had a son named Moab. With the younger, Bonami, which was the father of the Ammonites. Of course, Moab was the father of the Moabites. And God is saying, Moab has been at ease from his youth. You know, I saved you, Moab, when you were still in the loins of your father. I saved you out of Sodom. I left you here, and I've given you an easy life. You've been at ease from your youth. Now, let's look back here a little bit. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of Moses. I believe in chapter 2, and God through Moses, Moses is telling the people how far they've come. And he's made a record of their journeys and their travels. Since I found that tick on me, I got the creepy crawlies. Has hey, that ever happened to you? Yeah, you, you see one tick and all of a sudden, you know, whether you do or not, you got them all over you. They're just, you know, your skin starts to crawl. Whew. Boy, I hate ticks. I'd get out there and work, you know. I'd have them all up and down me. I'd, when we were younger, we'd check each other for ticks. <laughs> that, that could be fun, you know. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> be that as it may, though it's good to be young and married, ain't it? It's good to be married when you're old, too. Good to be married when you're old. I don't know what I'd do. I'd be awful lonesome. I can't even imagine my life without Velda. I'm sure she could imagine her life without me, but I cannot imagine my life without her. Chapter 2, 
of Deuteronomy. Moses is talking about their travels and how they came uh, to the borders of the Canaan. In chapter 2, verse 1, Moses writes, it said, Then we turned and took our journey into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea, as the Lord spake unto me, and we compassed Mount Seir many days. Mount Seir is in Edom. And the Lord spake unto me, saying, Ye have compassed this mountain long enough. Turn you northward. And command thou the people, saying, Ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren, the children of Esau. Esau is Edom. Esau was Isaac's other son, Jacob's twin brother, who should have had the birthright. Which dwell in Seir, and they shall be afraid of you. Take good heed unto yourselves, though therefore meddle not with them, for I will not give you their land, no, not so much as a footbreadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a possession. You shall buy meat of them for money, and that you may eat, and you, you may also buy water of them for money that you may drink. For the Lord thy God hath blessed thee in all the works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through this great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee. Thou hast lacked nothing. And when we passed by our brethren, the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, through the way of the plain from Elath, and from Ezion Gaber, we turned and passed by the way of the wilderness of Moab. Edom, Moab, Ammon, they're all, they're all part of modern-day Jordan. And the Lord said unto me, Distress not the Moabites, neither contend with them in battle. Don't fight them. For I will not give thee of their land for a possession. Because I have given R unto the children of Lot for a possession. The Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emims. And the Horams also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead, as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Now rise up, said I, and get thee over to the brook Zered. And they went to the brook Zered. And the space in which we came from Kadesh Barnea until we came over to brook Zered, was thirty and eight years until all the generation of the men of war were wasted out from among the hosts as the Lord swore unto them. He told them when they didn't want to invade the land that none of them would enter in. So he waited until all that generation had died and the ones who were under 20 years old and younger, they under 20 years old, they lived. So they're now the elders of the tribe. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from among the hosts until they were consumed. So it came to pass when all the men of war were consumed and dead from among the people that the Lord spake unto me, saying, Thou art to pass over through Ar, the coast of Moab, this day. And when thou comest nigh over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them, for I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon any possession because I have given it to the children of Lot for a possession. So, God had kept them from being invaded by Israel because of their lineage from Lot. And in, in Edom's case, Esau from Isaac. They didn't see or suffer war at that point. God gave them a break, and God kept giving them breaks. They worshipped their fertility god, 
they worshipped Chemosh called Molech by the Ammonites and the Canaanites who were there before them. They caused their children to to pass through the fire. That means they sacrificed them and then cut up the parts upon an altar of wood and burned it in a sacrifice to their heathen god. Of course, who is Satan the devil? There's an entity, as I explained, there are entities behind all of those false gods. Buddha, Allah. Of course, you can't make an image of Allah, but the idea of Allah is Satan the devil. All of these gods are devils, except for the Lord Jesus Christ. All religion is straight out of hell. It comes from Babel, as I've explained it. All began with Babel. That's why you see the mother-son cult everywhere you go. It is a perversion of the Son of God. And in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, there is no mother. There is no goddess. There is no Mother Earth. There is no Gaia. It all began with Semiramis and Tammuz. Nimrod, the Tower of Babel, it all began there. God did not punish them for their abominations for so long because they were the children of Lot. Good old Lot, who thought he got the best of Abraham in a land deal when they divided the land between them. Lot, who shouldn't have come along at all, God ordered Abraham to leave his family and go to where he would lead him and he led him to Canaan so I'm going to give you all this land he, but he didn't leave all his family behind he took his father Terah and then they had to wait until Terah died before they could move on they only got about 40 miles out of Ur of the Chaldees and Fish Camp that's Babylon wasn't called Babylon then Mesopotamia But it was where the Terror of Babel was. It was on the plain of Shinar. The Chaldee. You know, you see the pattern here and you realize that it's all one thing. It's all Babel. All religion comes from Babel. And one day, God is going to destroy Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, who is drunk with the wine of her fornication with all the kings of the earth. It's going to destroy it completely. That day's coming. We'll see it, but we'll be watching from the mezzanine. We'll be in heaven when that happens because that will come after the rapture. And after the rapture will be seven years of hell on earth, known as the Great Tribulation. And then Christ is coming back to settle all accounts. He will establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. There will be a kingdom for a thousand years where he will sit on the throne of his father, David, and rule with a rod of iron. And the law shall go forth from Zion. All of that will happen because the Bible says it's going to happen. I don't believe newspapers anymore. Matter of fact, I don't read them. Rag we got around here ain't fit to read anyway. I used to take it for the obituaries and the funny papers. But when it got to costing so much, then they went down. They only, they only printed, you know, like, like five times a week. And I, uh, I just let it go because it costs too much money for what I was getting. And, uh, I look at the New York Times and Washington Post online sometimes if there's a story I really want to go in depth on, but I know that what they tell me is a big fat lie. You don't watch TV news because it's just, uh, it's either pro Trump or anti Trump. If you want to know what's going on in India, you can't find out. You want to know what's going on in Africa, you can't find out. You want to know what's going on in Southeast Asia, you want to know what's going on in, in uh, <clears throat> You don't know what's going on in Vietnam or Cambodia or someplace like that or even Japan. You can't find out from watching TV. It ain't there. It's either 
hate Trump or love Trump. That's all it is on TV. So I get my news from the Bible. The Bible describes to me what's going on right now. I don't make the headlines fit the scripture. I read the scripture and then I recognize it in the headlines. Jesus is coming soon. You need to be ready. You need to be ready. Moab had been at ease from his youth. He was under the protection of God, Moab was. Don't leave him alone. Don't fight with him. Don't disturb him. As those are Lot's children. Now, how faithful is God for a righteous man who had was living, not living like a righteous man, but because he was Abraham's nephew, not even Abraham's seed? Wasn't even supposed to come with Abraham, supposed to stay in Ur of the Chaldees. Well, when they split up, God came and reaffirmed his promise to Abraham. And he didn't really start doing great, great things in Abraham's life until he split with Lot, because Lot was in the way. Keeping Lot went against the Lord's command. But still, God honored that relationship. And he, he honored the bastard, incestuous children of Lot that he had with his daughters. He honored them because of Lot's association with Abraham and because Lot believed what Abraham believed, but he sure didn't live like it. Peter calls him a righteous man. That's what the Bible says, so I have to believe it. But you couldn't tell it by looking at Lot that he was righteous. But the Bible says he was righteous. God honors the righteous. See, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Everything he does is way above my understanding. All I can do is report what he does. And how can I report what he does? Because he does what he did. If I read and study what he did, then I'll know what he does. Because he said, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. It's always the same. Verse 11, Moab had been at ease from his youth, and he hath settled on his leaves, and hath not been emptied from vessel to vessel, neither hath he gone into captivity. Therefore, his taste remained into him, and his sin was not changed. And he stayed, <laughs> he stayed the same. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send unto him wanderers that shall cause him to wander and shall empty his vessels and break their bottles. And that's what happened. Nebuchadnezzar brought his army. They came to Judah. They captured Judah. They burned Jerusalem. And then... Like in every army, there's guys wandering around. They're, they're foragers. They're looking for food, and they wander into Moab. And they start picking Moab to the bone. That's what happened in history. There was no great war campaign against Moab that we have a record of, but we know that they became completely subservient to Babylon, and uh, Babylon just subsumed them and just uh, controlled them. Uh emptied his vessels and break their bottles. They used Moab for a convenience store, and then when it was empty, they just went on their way. The Babylonian army, the army of the Chaldees. Remember, their objective was Egypt, not Moab. Moab was just a pit stop along the way. And Moab shall be ashamed of Chemosh, as the house of Israel was ashamed of Bethel, their confidence. You know... They trusted, Israel trusted in their the gods of gold that Jeroboam had set up at Bethel and Dan. Bethel was the chapel to Samaria, was the king's chapel, the king's temple. Uh, the Assyrians completely destroyed it. And then the remnant of the people who escaped and went down into Judah, they were always ashamed that they had ever worshipped at Bethel. And you know, Bethel was where 
where Abraham, when he first got to Canaan, he went to live at Bethel and he, he pitched his tent there and he made an altar unto the Lord at Bethel. It was the, the house of God. Jacob found the place. Jacob found the place when he was on his way out toward Mesopotamia again to stay with Uncle Laban. That's where the angels came down and visited him. And he says, this is the house of God. And he called it Bethel from that day forward. And then they became ashamed because they had served other gods. And Jeremiah is saying, you know, before 20 years is up, you'll be ashamed of your abomination, your false god. You're going to be ashamed of Chemosh, just like Israel was ashamed of Bethel and the abominations that were worshipped there. Well... This is a long chapter, even though it is a narrative chapter. We have to go back and grab things and explain them, but that's all right. The reason I spend so much time on those things, if you don't understand the Old Testament, there's no way you can understand the New Testament. You have to have a working knowledge of the Old Testament to know what's going on in the New Testament. That's why there's so many weirdo sects and... and uh, not weird sex. <laughs> we have plenty of weird sex. I meant sex. Uh, uh, la, 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 la. My teeth won't let me say that. Sect. Plural. Sex. Um, <clears throat> S-E-C-T-S. That's why you got so many sex running around and uh, saying things about God that just aren't true and the whole world follows after. Behold, the whole world is going after him. You know, the devil can raise a crowd anywhere. He can raise a crowd in the desert. You got a man preaching the word of God on a bare stage with no light show, no choir, no praise band. Who's going to listen to him? Well, there's quite a few that listen to me every morning doing the same thing. And I'm in my kitchen. I'm not even on a bare stage. You've been very faithful to listen to these programs. God will not let his word return void. And I know I spend a lot of time going back so that I can explain what's going on in the text. But if it's written in the Bible, it's important for us to know. Because that's where the answers are. Spend time with Jesus today. Worship him. Tell him you love him. Tell him you need him. Confess your sins to him. and Confess your faults one to another. Forgive. Accept forgiveness. Show the grace that was given to you. The grace that was bought by Jesus' blood on the old rugged cross. The grace that only God can give. The grace to forgive. The grace to heal the grace to be healed. The grace to live for Christ in a lost and dying world. I love y'all. I'll see you tomorrow.